<laughs> My name is Jochen Triesch, and uh, I have the pleasure of being the chair of this thesis committee for this event today, the uh, Defense of Sebastian's um, PhD. Um, I welcome you all, and as is tradition, I've just learned, uh, I will start by introducing the PhD committee. Um, we'll do this uh, from my right to the left, Justus Piata, who is a um, professor at the Université Binsbruck <laughs> in Austria. We have the PhD advisor, Pierre-Yves Boudeyer, sitting right here. Verena Hafner, professor in uh, Humboldt University, Berlin. Frank Behren, maître de conférence, Université Aberdeen. And Nivedita Mani, professor in uh, Göttingen, Germany. And the procedure is that Sebastian is going to talk about his research now for the next 45 minutes yep. or so. And then you have multiple rounds of questions. Uh, I think it's also permitted to have questions from the audience. But only those who have a PhD. <laughs> Can I have a quick show of hands? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Trying to remember this. Um, well, it's a pleasure again, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to Sebastian's presentation. Sebastian, please. Thank you, Jachet. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian Forestier. Today I'm happy to present the work I did during my PhD with Pierre Boudaillet. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for attending this defense and in particular the members of the jury. Thank you for accepting to review this work and thank you for traveling to Bordeaux. So the title of my PhD is Intrinsically Motivated Goal Exploration in Child Development and Artificial Intelligence, Learning and Development of Speech and Tool Use. If we let a nine-month-old uh, baby in a room full of toys, it starts to move around and play with all the objects it can reach. It grasps an object, puts it in its mouth, shakes it, makes noise with it, and at some point, throws it and gets interested in other objects. In a few hours, he has played with most of the objects in the room and experienced new shapes, colors, and sounds that improve his knowledge. Play playing does not require the intervention of a, of a parent. As you can see, nobody is telling the baby uh, which object he should grasp or what he should do with an object. But this intrinsic motivation to explore could be an important mechanism of child development. My work has two main objectives. The first is to understand these intrinsic motivations in children, in particular the mechanisms of intrinsic motivations and their role in development are not understood. And the second objective is to improve the learning abilities of robots inspired by the development of children. So in this talk, I will first introduce the context of this work and then describe uh, my contributions on those two objectives. I will describe a previous experiment with babies in a tool use setup to, to try to understand their motivations when they play with tools and toys. I will provide a formal framework for the representation of agents that learn through goal exploration. I will describe several models of the development of tool use and speech. And I will uh, talk about uh, robotic experiments with real robots. At the end of my talk, I will also um, describe several limitations and perspectives of this work. In psychology, Piaget was one of the first to describe the sensory motor development of babies. And he viewed babies as active explorers that learn while um, exploring solutions to everyday problems. The concept of intrinsic motivations then started to be studied in the 40s and 50s. And one of the definitions psychologists gave to intrinsic motivations is the doing of an activity for its inherent satisfactions rather than from for some separable consequence. So the, indeed, the baby we, we just seen was not looking for food or for money, but in fact, we don't really know what he was looking for. What are those inherent satisfactions? And psychologists proposed uh, many mechanisms for this. Intrinsic motivations has been described 
as a drive to experience intermediate levels of incongruity or of cognitive dissonance, a drive to fill knowledge gaps, or a drive to, to be in a state of flow, which is uh, um, uh, a balance between your skills and your activities. However, those different possible mechanisms have been little studied uh, in, the, in children, and most experiments evaluate properties of curiosity in adults and through questionnaires. So this intrinsic motivation um, to learn seems fundamental, but its particular mechanisms and role in development is an open question. Now, if we turn to the field of artificial intelligence, we've seen rapid progress since the 50s with the achievement of famous milestones, such as defeating the, the champions at the, the games of chess or Go. However, in those uh, examples and in other recent advancements, the artificial agents learn in a way very different from humans. They require uh, many millions of training samples and they also require that uh, an engineer specifies all the objectives of the task to learn. Another approach to build uh, an intelligent machine has been proposed in the 50s by Alan Turing. Instead of trying to build a ch uh, uh, directly an intelligent machine, we could build a child machine and give it learning abilities that simulate the one of children. This idea is now part of the field of uh, developmental robotics. So the idea is that uh, developmental psychologists observe babies and elaborate hypotheses on their learning mechanisms. And then with, with robots, we can test those hypotheses, uh, for instance, to, to see the consequences of a particular learning mechanism on the behavior of the robot. And so modeling the development of, of children with robots can help us with our two objectives, understanding, int understanding intrinsic motivations in children and improving the learning abilities of robots. Previous models of um, intrinsic motivations in children have been of two types, two categories, knowledge-based and competence-based. In knowledge-based intrinsic motivations, the agent monitors the consequences of its actions and it uh, looks at its new knowledge and compare it to the, its previous knowledge and it's able to, to measure, to estimate its progress when doing uh, new experiments. And in competence-based intrinsic motivations, the agent chooses its own goals and estimates a measure of progress to achieve its goals. In both cases, the, learn the measure of progress is used by the agents to choose uh, which activities, which skills he will train in the next iterations. In my work, I'm, I'm in particular in interested in the development of speech and tool use. In their first years of life, babies learn to, to control their vocal tract to produce the sounds, the, the vowels and the syllables of their native language. And at the same time, they learn to, to, to grasp and reach objects and to manipulate tools such as a spoon or a rake. And those skills are learned by uh, actually in interacting actively with the environment. But the role of intrinsic motivations in learning those skills uh, is not really understood. And if we look at how robots learn those skills, this is also quite different from a baby. Uh, usually, the, the machines that learn to speak don't have a body, so the, the vocalizations they learn have no related meaning in a physical environment. And the robots that learn to use tools often have, have already predefined motor primitives to move their, their body. And the tool is also often uh, attached already to the hand. So this is uh, really different from babies. And, and so learning those skills in robots is a challenge. And it's important to, to understand the, the motivations of, of babies and children. In the next part, I will describe a previous experiment that we reanalyzed with a collaborator. So in, in uh, the research of, 
of tool use in infancy, um, they, they focused on understanding which skills are required at which age. And for instance, they studied the, the skill of using a string to retrieve a toy, or using a stick, using a rake. And in the study, they placed a very attractive toy like this one, with uh, an interesting color and shape, so that the baby gets really interested in uh, getting the toy. However, the baby could still be interested in other objects like this tool, or any other object left in the environment, and may maybe choosing its own goals, uh, different from the, the goal of, get of getting this toy. So to, to study this, uh, this possibility, uh, we collaborated with Lauriane Redfisher. She's a developmental psychologist, and she has run recently such a, a tool use experiment with her colleagues at the University of Oxford. Their goal was to test the, the influence of uh, different types of training on the, the performance of 21 month olds in this tool use task. So they placed uh, this interesting toy inside a transparent tube. And the only way to, to get the toy is to insert uh, several blocks in, in the tube. This baby explored the apparatus, but she doesn't manage to get the toy in, in this first trial. And when the baby gets uh, not interested in, in getting the toy, the experimenter says something like, uh, uh, what can you do? Uh, how can you get the toy? In the second trial, she succeeds to, to get the toy. And in fact, in this experiment, two thirds of the babies succeed to get the toy in their first trial. And this is much higher than expected at this age, uh, based on previous uh, experiments. And there's no obvious reason to explain this. So let's look at other cases of success and failure. So this baby considered the, the toy and the blocks as a train. And when the toy gets out of the tube, she says, oh no. So maybe her goal was not to, to get the toy and to play with the toy. She continues to, to insert objects in the transparent tube. In this example, the mother seems more interested in playing with a toy than the baby. <laughs> and the, the baby takes the toy and tries to, to put it back in the tube. So again, the, the goal of the baby may not be to, to get the toy, to, to play with the toy. <laughs> this example is considered as a failure in this, in this trial. The baby do doesn't manage to get the toy out. But she's happy with the result <laughs> and pushes the, the apparatus away uh, as if the experiment was done. <laughs> so babies seem to explore the setup with their own goals. And this opens many questions, such as why and when would, would they change their goal? Is this choice affected by the environment, such as uh, the actions of the experimenter or the position of the toy in the tube? And in the end, does this exploration interfere with the success rates in this task? To understand those motivations, we analyzed in more detail the videos of this experiment with Lauriane. Our approach was to take into account all the possible exploratory behaviors of babies and all the events in the environment they could be correlated with. We included the, their gaze, we annotated it with their gaze, their actions with their hands. Uh, we estimated their goals and strategy based on their behavior. We coded the actions of the experimenter and the caregiver, and, and we also recorded the position of the toy in the tube. We analyzed three trials of 32 babies. Each baby uh, results in one ethogram like this. And um, so we, we first looked at the, the diversity of the behaviors of babies. 
uh, we counted the number of different behaviors uh, per trial. This is the, the histogram of, of the number of different behaviors. So in, in most trials, there were more than four different behaviors in one single, single trial. But it could go up to 10 or 13 different behaviors. And this diversity of behaviors is found both in successful trials and in, in uh, failed trials. So babies seem to, to actively explore the setup uh, and they try, they try out different behaviors. I, uh, we then looked at their diversity of goals and strategies. We, uh, we estimated their goals uh, from, from their behaviors, but it was in fact uh, quite a hard task. But here are the, are the main results. When their goal seems to really be to insert objects and not to get the toy out, they have a very high success rate. And this goal was quite frequent. Oops, sorry. Um, the success rate was 9 out of 10 when they just want to, to insert objects. And at the moment when the toy goes out of the tube, babies play with the toy in only half of those trials. In the other half, either they continue to insert objects, either they try to they take the toy and they try to put it back, or they don't do anything with the toy uh, you know, with the apparatus. So in those cases, uh, the, the goal of the baby seems to be different than, than playing with the toy. So um, in this experiment, it was quite hard to, to focus the babies on one particular goal, and they were exploring with their, their own different goals. They could succeed uh, the, the trial or fail the trial while they, they were exploring their own goals. And in those cases, the, the success status of the trial may be uh, not correlated with the, the Tulio skill that the experiment is assumed to measure. Um, the, the goal of inserting objects was quite frequent and could be the reason why the, the success rate was high. So the, the intrinsic motivations of children uh, seem to have impacted the, the success results. And this data also shows that um, if we want to model the behaviors of babies in this uh, tool use setup, um, an intrinsic motivation based on their competence where the agents would choose its own goals may be more appropriate than uh, a knowledge-based intrinsic motivation. In the next part, I provide the formal framework for the representation of agents that learn through goal exploration. Um, the previous experiments with the uh, competence-based interesting motivations have all used uh, different variations of goal exploration. They all have their, their different notations, their different assumptions, and different uh, variants of a, a goal uh, generation algorithm. Uh, but they have similarities that justify the need of a common framework. And also other approaches could be related to, to goal exploration even if they don't explicitly define goals. So a clear formalism could, be, uh, could help understand the, the similarities between different approaches. So here I define the framework of intrinsically motivated goal exploration processes. Its two main ingredients are goal exploration and intrinsic rewards. Goal exploration is a method to learn uh, uh, the relation between an action space and the goal space by choosing goals in the goal space and trying to reach them. So let's imagine that in this example, the, the action space represents the, the motors of a hand and the goal space represents the position of a ball. The agents has already tried action A1 and A2 and this led to uh, the ball in states S1 and S2. And now in the goal exploration loop, the agent chooses a new goal, G. And it's going to use its policy to infer an appropriate action to reach this goal. In my work, I use policies uh, based on a simple nearest neighbor search. So if the goal is here, the agents look for its the nearest state it could reach in the past. Here it would be S2. The agents get uh, the action that was used to reach S2, which is here A2, and add some exploration nodes 
to explore new, new actions, which, which would lead here to action A. Um, this, this kind of policies where we keep in memory the, all those samples is called the population-based uh, policy in, in this work. The agent then uh, executes this action A, which leads to state S, which can be different from the goal G, of course. Uh, but the, the key to goal exploration is that even if the agent reach goal S, uh, no, state S, while, while aiming at goal G, it will be able to reuse this behavior later when its goal will be to reach somewhere close to S. So the agent updates its policy, which can impact many goals and not only the goal he was trying to reach. Okay, but here I didn't explain where the goal space comes from and how the agent chooses goal in this goal space. So let me introduce several notations and assumptions of the MJ framework. I assume the uh, state space and an action space are provided to the agent. When the agent executes a trajectory, uh, executes a sequence of actions, this leads to a behavioral trajectory denoted tau here. And I assume that agents can, can build goals without external knowledge, so they are intrinsically motivated. And goals as fitness functions that represent how well a goal is solved by, the par by a particular behavior. For instance, in my work, I use fitness functions um, that compare the, the goal and the state that was reached at the end. Uh, so it can be defined with a negative distance between the goal and the state, which, which would be maximal if the state is equal to the goal. And I also assume that the, those fitness functions can be computed uh, as they are defined by the agents without external knowledge. I assume that they can be computed for any goal and at, at any time. For instance, if later the agents um, wants to reach a new goal, he can compute the fitness of all the previous behaviors to reach this new goal. <coughs> and now we have a goal space. The agents in the loop has to choose particular goals at each iteration. And uh, I assume that the agents estimates a measure of how interesting goals are for, for learning. And this measure is called an intrinsic reward. Um, here, uh, uh, let's imagine we have an agent that is trying to reach five goals, represented by those different colors. This would be the, the competence of the agents on each goal over time. And this, the progress on each old goal over time. The agents can compute its competence to reach a goal with this same uh, function. And the progress can be computed at the derivative of the average competence. <coughs> so if, for instance, the goal is here and the, agents, the agent reach, uh, gets closer and closer to the goal, the average distance decreases, so the, the agent is making progress. With this intrinsic reward, the agent would prefer to explore the blue goal first because it's making the most progress, then orange goal when there is no more progress on the blue goal but some progress on the orange one, and then the green one. Okay, um, in previous experiments with goal exploration, w only one goal space was used. But if I want to study uh, tool use in environments where there may be uh, many objects, like uh, several sticks, uh, toys, boxes, it may be more relevant to define one goal space per object. And in this case, the, the agents would learn a policy for, for each object to control each object and would, would monitor its learning progress to control the object and choose to train to explore objects on which it's making the most progress. <coughs> the MJ framework is related to other approaches in machine learning and optimization. In reinforcement learning, several works have uh, in introduced goals in the policy and the reward function. But um, they, they all use goals that, that contain or are built with uh, external knowledge. The, the auxiliary task is more related to intrinsic motivations. Uh, in those, in those works, uh, the, um, 
the, the agent tries to, to optimize uh, one task defined by the experimenter, but also many tasks that it can uh, optimize by itself, such as trying to control a pixel of the camera. The framework of no novelty search is also related to the IMG framework. Um, in, in, in these works, the, the optimization process is not given any objective, but tries to maximize the novelty of the, the behaviors that are discovered. And in the end, it makes the agent focus on the frontier of the already discovered regions. And it's, we, we see the same uh, with the uh, agents choosing their own goals. There is also the quality diversity framework, and this we can directly express it in the IMJ framework. Uh, we can define goals that uh, encode the, how the, those algorithms work, uh, apart from the fact that they usually use a quality function that again uh, represents uh, expert knowledge defined by the experimenter. In the, in the next part, I'm going to explain uh, several uh, models of the development of tool use. So if we look uh, with a broad view at the development of tool use and its precursors in the, in the two first years of life, it can be described as uh, three successive uh, overlapping stages. Babies first explore their body then they interact with one single object, and later they explore the interaction with several objects, like in Tullius. And in each phase, they continue to uh, display behaviors of the previous phases. I studied this pattern with robots, with two questions in mind. What would be the impact of the goal representation algorithm and of the choice of particular goals? So I designed this uh, tool use setup. We have um, a robotic arm, so it's simulated in 2D. The arm has three joints and one gripper. It can interact, grasp those two sticks, one long and one smaller, and it needs the stick to reach for this, uh, this toy, and then it can put this toy in any of those boxes. So the agent executes a motor a sequence of actions, and then receives at, as a feedback the trajectory of all the objects in the environment. With the active model babbling algorithm, which is a particular case of the MJ framework for multiple objects, the, the agents monitor its learning progress to control each of those objects and choose to explore the one with uh, the higher learning progress. Here is an example of uh, movements after uh, 100,000 iterations. So the agent is getting uh, the, the tools and putting the ball in, in, in any of those boxes. This is uh, all the positions where the agent succeeded to, to put the ball. And we can see that at some point it got interested in exploring the boxes. Uh, there are a lot of movements uh, where he, he put the ball uh, near, near those boxes. If we look at uh, one agent over time, the behaviors of one agent, and if I categorize the, with the, the three categories of behaviors we, uh, without object, with w interacting with one object, and uh, the interaction between several objects, we can see those three uh, phases. At the beginning, it explores mostly its body, so it's the hand. Then, uh, in, a s in the second phase, it starts to explore also uh, one object, and later it explores the, the interaction between the tool and the toy, but still continue to explore the, the other objects. Um, I, I, I studied other uh, conditions with different uh, goal representations and algorithm for selection of goals. But only the agents with a modular representation of goals based on objects and choosing goals based on learning progress showed that uh, those uh, three overlapping stages of behavior with transitions between phases that are quite smooth. In a second experiment, 
I, s I studied in particular the choice of strategy in a setting where the agent would have several strategies to, to reach the same goal. And Siegler observed a, an overlapping waves pattern in the choice of strategies by children. Um, so children would, would use several strategies at any point in time and the transitions between phases of behaviors would uh, change uh, smoothly. And he, he modeled this, this pattern with uh, saying that children would choose their strategies based on the performance of strategies. So choosing the strategies that lead to the better result, the best results. In this experiment, I, I showed that uh, this overlapping waves pattern is also compatible with uh, choice of strategies based on performance progress. But in the interest of time, I won't uh, detail this one. Um, those, those two experiments uh, suggest that an intrinsic motivation based on choosing goals and, and monitoring the learning progress would be a good model of those, those aspects of Tullius development. In the next part, I describe um, a model of the development of speech and Tullius in a unified model. Um, in recent computational models of the development of speech, the agents learn to control a vocal tract, which is simulated, and uh, they, they have two, two main mechanisms, which is one, exploring the vocal tract by themselves, and second, trying to imitate sounds that they, they are provided with. For instance, in the model of moulin frier the, the agent is intrinsically motivated to produce a diversity of sounds, but also imitates uh, the sounds that he receives that are uh, adult speech utterances. In those different models, the agents don't have a body, so the vocalizations they produce uh, have no meaning in a physical environment. And on the other hand, if we uh, robots have a body, and they, they could uh, interact with humans through language. In the previous experiment, they were able to, to learn the meaning of instructions or to use human instructions to learn new skills. But to my knowledge, there's no mm, robotic model of the development of speech from scratch and that would use um, goal exploration and imitation. So my question here is, um, could a robot learn to produce words that have a meaning in its environment and somehow understand this meaning through uh, exploration and imitation? I studied this, this uh, setup. Uh, the body of the robot has two parts, this robotic arm and also this simulated vocal tract. So the, with the arm, the agent can interact with uh, stick and toys. And it can also um, control the seven articulators of a vocal tract. And when it's uh, moving its arm or, or the vocal tract, it receives as feedback the, or the trajectory of the objects and the sounds. To study imitation, we also included this caregiver, simulated, that interacts with the agent in two ways. First, if the agent touches a toy, the caregiver says the name of the toy. And this can be used later for imitation. And if the agent doesn't touch a toy, the caregiver may say other words that have no meaning here, which I call distractors. And second, when the agent with his vocal tract produces the name of a toy, or a sound that is close enough to the name of a toy, the caregiver uh, brings the toy towards the agent. Here, uh, I have two motor spaces and six sensory spaces, and the agents learn policies between uh, all those spaces, uh, mainly through goal exploration. But in the case of sounds, uh, the agents sometimes explore autonomously and sometimes try to imitate the, the sounds of the caregiver, either the, the toy names or the, the distractor sounds. The sounds are represented uh, as a trajectory in the space of the two first four months, F1 and F2. 
uh, and the words are, uh, so we, we can only represent vowels here, the words are composed of three vowels, for instance, ou, ou, would be one word in this environment. And when the caregiver produces perfectly the sound ou, the agent receives the, this perfect trajectory from ou to ou to ou. I plotted here in red uh, several um, random actions of the agent to give you an idea of, of the effects, the trajectories, sound trajectory that can be reached. And in blue, it's when the agent tries to imitate this world. So it's not that bad. And in fact, uh, I defined the thresholds and this one, these imitations are good enough to be recognized by the caregiver as the, the name of the toy. Uh, this figure shows the imitation error after, uh, after long uh, training time. So this represents the axis represent the imitation error. At the beginning, if the agents try to, to imitate one word for the first time, we may have a large imitation error between its sound and the, the sound of the caregiver. But after some training, the sound can go below this threshold, at which point the caregiver recognizes the word. If this is the name of a toy, the caregiver gives uh, the toy to the agent. And if this is uh, another word, she uh, the caregiver doesn't do anything. And the interesting uh, effect here is that as agents often want to get the toy, and using the vocal tract to say the name of the toy uh, makes the caregiver bring the toy, they often train to to produce the, the name of the toys more than uh, the, the distractor words. So they, over time, they get better at, uh, at imitating the name of the toys uh, better than the distractors. So in this experiment, the agents uh, succeed to get the toy with three strategies, with their arm, with using the stick, or with their vocal tract, in which case they use the, the caregiver as a social tool. And um, the, the, the fact that the agents are choosing their own goals related to objects makes the learning of the name of terms uh, faster than other words. So the, this, this experiment would predict that when infants play with their care caregiver, the fact that they are choosing goals could accelerate their vocal learning related to objects. In this model, it should be noted that we don't assume any understanding of tools or of speech, but this uh, simple set of policies make the agent, in the end, display behaviors with a tool use structure. We extended this also to a real robotic setup, where this torso robot learns to learn his body and to play with his toy and to produce sounds. And after some time, he succeeds to produce the name of this toy with the help of his caregiver here, the Baxter robot, uh, and uh, with the same interaction as the in this simulated experiment. In this part, um, I, I describe several uh, experimental setup that are more complex and this one is uh, is a real uh, robotic setup so we we have this torso robot that is placed in front of two joysticks one of the joysticks controls this robotic toy which can uh, push a ball and produce lights and sounds the when the ball moves it can produce lights and sounds there's also a distractor object in this environment that moves um, independently of, of the agent. And, and again, when the agent uh, moves its arm, it receives the, as a feedback the, position, the trajectory of all the objects in its environment. This is uh, an example of uh, development in a few hours. So this agent has intrinsic rewards based on learning progress.
this is new, we, we didn't expect it to happen. <laughs> um, this is an example of um, learning progress over time on each object for one agent. At the beginning, the, the agent explores mostly its hand because it's the only object that it can move and it's making progress to, to move this object. Then it discovers uh, two joysticks, so it starts to make progress and start to focus on them. Later, it discovered the, the, rob the robotic toy and the ball, so it explores also them, but it continues to explore the other objects. And the random distractor, the objects that move independently of the robot, has uh, the agent has a very low progress to, to, ex to control this as it's random. So this is an interesting effect of this uh, learning progress idea, that the agent don't focus uh, when it, it, it can't learn uh, anything. With this experiment, so we, we run uh, 10 to 20 trials of about one day uh, on, those, on all, all those robots, and we tried different conditions. Again, we, the, the agents that had a, a goal representation m uh, that is modular based on objects learn explored much better than the agents with a flat representation, a representation that would include all the objects. Agents th that choose objects based on learning progress explore better than agents that choose objects randomly. And I, I also uh, studied two other control conditions here. In one condition, the, the agents only explores the ball, and this leads to a very bad exploration. It don't even uh, reach uh, the joysticks. Um, so even if an experimenter would want the agents to just learn uh, to move the ball, it would be more efficient to, to let the agents explore all the objects of the environment. And in a second condition, I designed by hand a learning curriculum, the best I could think of, with the, the exploration of the most simple objects first and the, the objects more complex later. And, and those agents were as good as agents uh, choosing autonomously uh, the objects they, they explore with learning progress. A uh, quick note, the, the, this setup and this algorithm is quite sample efficient. In less than one day, uh, the, the robots learn to, to move the ball and to produce lights and sounds. I studied other environment, one simulated, uh, to, to make uh, more experiments and, uh, and statistics. And one based on Minecraft with the help of Remy Portelas. So if you're interested, we can discuss them later. Um, okay, so to sum up, the contributions of this work uh, were the following. I highlighted the impact of intrinsic motivations in child experiments. I designed the IMJ framework as a compact and general framework for the representation of agents that learn through goal exploration. I described the uh, uh, models of the development of tool use, uh, showing that with an intrinsic motivation based on learning progress, the agents, the behaviors of agents over time have similarities with the developmental trajectories of children. I designed this uh, speech development model uh, where the agents could in interaction with the caregiver could learn um, to produce words uh, that have a meaning in its environment and somehow understand this meaning. And then I, I showed uh, more results in, in different setups. So now I'm going to, to describe several limitations and perspectives of this work. Um, in the Toulouse experiment I described uh, at the beginning, I showed that babies have diverse goals and that it could impact the, the success results. But this experiment, evaluating a Toulouse <coughs> skill of babies at a particular age, is um, a typical experimental paradigm of uh, trying to, to study Toulouse in children. So this, this impact may happen, in fact, in many other studies. For instance, in the study by Koslowski and Brunner, they placed this um, interesting toy 
on one side of a lever that can rotate. The baby is seated here at the beginning and uh, the baby has to, to take this lever, rotate it to be able to catch the toy. And in this experiment, they observe that some babies are very good. They rotate the lever, they get the toy. Some babies don't do anything. But some babies just explore the rotation of the lever. They explore, they explore. And at some point, they see that the, the toy is within reach, so they, they get the toy. So it seems that in this behavior, the fact that the baby succeeds is not, uh, not necessarily related to a tool use skill, but still in, in this experiment, it's continued as a success. Um, so in the end, I think that uh, we should we should consider the, the, all the potential goals of babies when we design a such an experiment and be careful when we interpret the results because babies may have other goals. Um, so I showed that babies have diverse goals, but I could not give much insights into the, the particular mechanisms of their choice of goals and strategies. And one reason is that in, uh, it was quite hard to annotate those uh, goals and strategies based on behaviors. Um, so to study the goals more easily, we, we could have several toys in the setup, several interesting toys, and several strategies to reach all those toys. Um, so for instance, uh, this setup is used in bird studies. There is food that is uh, locked inside, and the birds can use uh, four strategies to retrieve the food pulling a string, uh, using a stick, pushing a ball, or going through a window. Um, so we, we could have several of those boxes in an environment where the baby would be free to, to move around and, and, uh, and choose a goal for an object and choose a strategy for that goal. That goal. So it would be uh, maybe a more efficient way to, to study the dynamics of the choice of goals and strategies. In the different parts of uh, this work, I, I used uh, setups where the, the agent is assumed to, to have a perceptual system that allows it to track uh, the objects. Um, so we, we, for instance, in the robotic setup, we put a camera and we pre-process the image and we give directly the, the position of the, of the toy to the robot. But this is a limitation, and, and we studied recently uh, with Alexandre Perret a way to, to learn the representation from the pixels, a, re a representation of, of this object oops, that could be used later for, uh, for goal exploration, choosing its own goals for this object. So we did this uh, with one object and in, in this uh, 2D simulation. This work was um, extended later by Adrien Laversen Fino, where the agents have uh, a modular representation of, they can learn a representation, modular representation of several objects, those two objects, and use this representation to choose goals. And, and they showed that this representation is as good as uh, hand-designed uh, representation. Uh, in, in those two works, uh, the representation is learned and then the agents uh, explore with its own goals. Uh, but recently, there is also this work by uh, Chris Wenke and colleagues where they, they learn the representation online. So, in fact, they, they update, they retrain the, the, the representation every uh, every uh, certain number of uh, episodes. And they show that uh, wi with this IMJ agent that learn online, uh, the, the agents can learn new complex patterns in this ga game of life environment. Uh, this is called Lenya. And that were not uh, found before. And they, and they are uh, as good as uh, representation that are uh, designed by hand. Another limitation uh, in this work is that the, the nearest neighbor search in, in the policy is not really accurate. And um, we implemented 
primi uh, motor primitives that are open loop, so they cannot adapt online to ch unexpected changes in the environment. Uh, in a recent work by Cedric Ola, the NIMJEP agent is used in a first phase to find a diverse set of uh, trajectories and those trajectories ad are then used by uh, a deep uh, reinforcement learning agents that start from, the from these but learn a, a better policy. There's another approach also which is to learn a, a monolithic policy, so a policy that, is, that uh, takes a goal as input and outputs the, the particular actions to, to, to execute at each time step. In this work, the, the agents uh, throughout learning fills a replay buffer with the trajectories that have a high learning progress. Now, uh, I think there are a number of challenges for future work with the IMJEP uh, framework. One is the, the development of representations that, um, that can follow and support an increase in the complexity of the skills of the agent. And for instance, in a, an open-ended uh, environment where we don't know in advance what, what would be the, the particular skills the agent would need to learn. A second uh, challenge is uh, to learn in much more complex environments that uh, we did uh, up to now. In particular, uh, in, in human-like environment, there is noise in, in the motors, I mean, in the muscles, in the, in the perceptions, in the contingencies. The, the caregiver would not be perfectly contingent, for instance. So the, um, it's, uh, it's an important uh, work and then uh, integrating intrinsic motivations with social guidance but social guidance can take up uh, multiple forms it can be a reinforcement demonstrations uh, instructions explanations and in my work and I only studied um, uh, demonstrations of adult sounds in the speech uh, model okay so the parts of this work has been published in um, four conference papers and there, there are still two journal papers that are in the work. One on uh, the framework and experiments and one on the ch children experiment. With this, uh, I would like to thank you all for, uh, for your attention and I would like to thank all the Flowers team my supervisor Pierre-Yves, uh, all the engineers that did uh, great work uh, with the robots, so Yo Johan, uh, Theo, Damien, Pierre, uh, the interns I had the chance to work with, but all the others also. I'm grateful to my collaborator uh, Lorian for um, accepting to, to share our data and to work with uh, developmental roboticists. Whoops, and uh, now I'm happy to to answer your questions. Thank you, Sebastian.